Thank you. May I ask you how old you are? I am 77 years old, but will be 78 at the end of this month. Good for you, sir. And, and what is your current address? In Marlboro, Massachusetts. And your marital status? I'm married. You have children? Uh, yes. <laughs> They're all gone. We have, uh, I have had a second marriage, so my wife brought three children, I brought three children, and then we have two foster sons who are brothers, Vietnamese minors. No longer minors, they're grown in their 30s. I was going to ask you if you have children. <laughs> yes, the answer is definitely yes. How about grandchildren? Uh, yes. <laughs> How many? <laughs> yeah. Okay, again. You're winning, let's keep going. <laughs> okay, we, we count the Vietnamese people as part of our family, and they count us as their parents. So there are four there, and one with one of my sons, and two with uh, my wife's uh, children. So that's seven. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you how you, you came to decide to uh, bring Vietnamese children into your family? Yes, um, my wife was working for Lutheran Social Service, in the Lutheran Social Service building in North Dakota. She was head of a hospice program and uh, they had a very good unaccompanied minors program. We had a big house, our children were gone, so she came home one day and said, we have room here, I have a great idea. So we wound up with one of those brothers uh, who came to us when he was uh, about 16 years old. His brother uh, came later. Uh, he, he had actually arrived in the United States before Wong. Uh, and uh, th when Wong moved to Atlanta some years later, then Wong came in and moved with us for another three years or so. so. You use the phrase unaccompanied children. Yeah. Uh, can you explain that? Yes, uh, this, uh, this was a program where uh, people who had uh, sent their children with the boat people out of Vietnam. Yeah. They went through a refugee camp. These two boys uh, went to one year apart. The mother had uh, arranged to pay for their uh, trip to the United States. Well, she hoped they would get to the United States, but uh, the older boy was quite angry about it because he wanted to stay in Vietnam. And his mother said, I'd rather have you anywhere in the world alive than here dead. So uh, he took, uh, he was on the boat, he went to the Philippines, and uh, North Dakota had a very good program within social service, so he, then he wound up in Fargo, North Dakota, and his brother wound up there later. I cannot think of two more disparate places in the world than Vietnam <laughs> and Fargo, North Dakota. That's right, that's right. It's, an, as I used to say, to, I used to be a, a, a bishop of the Lutheran Church, and when I would tell pastors who were reluctant to come to North Dakota, I'd say, well, you, can't, you aren't at the end of the world, but you can see it from there. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have to stand on tiptoes right. <laughs> either. <laughs> Where were you born? I was born in South Dakota, Gary, South Dakota, which is right on the eastern edge. The uh, Minnesota was almost across our backyard. <laughs> and it's about half, it's halfway up between uh, north and south. So. Is this Red River Valley country? No, but uh, a little farther north is. When I went back to Fargo uh, some years ago to, to be, become bishop, that was, that's in the Red River Valley. In fact, we lived right on the Red River of the North and experienced uh, the, one of the major floods, but not quite as major as the one a few years ago. Oh yeah, that's, those were terrible. It was in our backyard. It came right up to our deck. Really? It was, yeah, it was about 18 feet above flood level. So. That's a lot of water. A lot of water. Where were you raised, Harold? I was raised in South Dakota. I was in Gary, where I was born. And then uh, when I was in the fifth grade, my father had a job. It's, he'd lost his job in the bank. He was a local uh, country banker. And he lost his job in 1931 when two small banks merged and his brother, who was cashier of one, was in the one that stayed. So my dad was without work for maybe a year. And then he got work as a cashier in another bank 50 miles away. So that's where the family was established. I'm the only child. So my dad and I lived mm -hmm. together. My mother was a superintendent of schools. So they, they commuted something like eight years during their marriage from the, between those two cities, two towns. They're really towns, like 450 people each. <laughs> those are pretty small. And they're pretty yeah. small, but that's the usual thing in the Dakotas. Yes. Uh, how did you come to gravitate to the east? Uh, okay, that, I'll try to make that short. <laughs> yeah, in uh, 1980, we were living in Philadelphia. My wife was working at Graduate Hospital in Philadelphia, and I got a telephone call. I was working for the church, one of the church-wide divisions of the Lutheran Church in America, and I received a call that I was on the second ballot for bishop. Well, it was president, they called him that year, because they 
they changed the name to Bishop in 1980 after I'd been elected. But I called her up and said, uh, I got a telephone call. They're having a convention out in Fargo, North Dakota. Should I go? And she says, well, you never know what the Holy Spirit's up to. But if you get elected, next time I decide where we're going to live. This is next time. <laughs> My wife is now president of Lutheran Social Services of New England. So really? she got that job. We commuted for about two years at, until I retired. She's, she and I are about 19 years in age difference. She's 19 years younger than I. So she's going to support me in my old age. That's very good. When I get there. <laughs> when you get there, yeah. You're in middle age now and you're moving along. That's right. So where did you graduate from high school then? In, in Lake Norton, South Dakota. Okay. And then uh, I went, do you want to know where I, where I went after that? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I went to, we, we were uh, not impoverished, but we were certainly not very rich. So we couldn't afford anything but a state college. So I went to South Dakota State College in Brookings, South Dakota. And that was in 1940. 1940 and in 1941, the United States That's right. uh, entered the war. And I was uh, sitting at my desk in the dormitory reading my physics text when it came over the radio that uh, we had been bombed at Pearl Harbor. Had you ever heard of Pearl Harbor before no. that? Did you know where it was? Uh, well, I knew right away then. I, yeah. I probably didn't know where it was until they said it was Hawaii. And this is your first year of college then? That's right. Mm -hmm. Did you have some inkling that this might affect you? Uh, well, yes. I mean, the next day the whole college was convened in the, in the armory. This was the land grant college had an ROTC program, Reserve Officers Training Corps. And uh, it was required for freshmen and sophomore men you had to take two years of military training. But they convened the whole college, uh, all, all the students and the faculty, in the armory, and we listened to the President of the United States uh, when Roosevelt On gave December his 8th. infamy speech, yes, yeah. December 8th. And um, I mean, being in a, a military training course, of course, we've been talking about the possibility of war. But uh, because we, we were aware that things were getting pretty heated up with the Japanese. Had you been in ROTC before Pearl Harbor? Uh, well, I started there, but see, I, but not long because this was 1941. I'd been in it for a year. I started yeah. in 1940, you see. So this would have been my second year from September until, uh, until December. Did that automatically put you into some kind of reserve? Unit? No, you had to opt for that. Okay. So, and the, the reason that we opted for it, there were 44 of us It finally went to the infantry school. I think 50 went, but not all made it. Um, they told us, the uh, military department, that if we would sign up for advanced ROTC, which would automatically put us in the enlisted reserve corps, we would be able to finish our college with a uh, second lieutenant commission, and then we would go into active duty. Well, we, we, I signed up on August 27th in uh, 1942, and on April 18th, 1943, they called up the enlisted reserve, so we didn't quite make it. <laughs> I'd, I had gone to summer school, so I actually had finished three years of college, but they did not keep their word. But nobody, we, none of us uh, felt bad about that. We were ready to go. <laughs> April 1943, you entered the United States military service? Uh, on an active basis. As a second lieutenant? No, no, as a no. private. As a private? Yes, so. Okay, and where did you go into the military? We, we entered at Fort Snelling, which is in Minneapolis, or St. Paul, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was the entry, point of entry. And then the, uh, the group was sent. We were intact as a group. We, went, we got on the train together in Brookings, South Dakota, dis, disembarked from the train uh, in Minneapolis. And they took us by trucks out to Fort Snelling. And then they sent us as a, as a group to uh, Camp Walters, which is in, uh, uh, just outside of Mineral Wells, Texas, uh, between Dallas and Fort Worth area, for basic training. So at Fort Snelling, uh, as a group, you guys were all assigned to go down to Texas. Right. How did you get there, on a train? On a train. Yeah. yeah a what train. happened to you in Texas? Then? Well, we were assigned to different units, so uh, not all of us were in the same unit. I was, in, uh, I was the only uh, person in the enlisted reserve in the barracks that I happened to be in. So I mean most of the men were older men and then some ASTP, that's Armor Specialized Training Program, who had uh, flunked out of the program. <laughs> and so I was with people who were in general not at the same academic level I was even at that point. 
but I had a, I, we had I had a good experience. <laughs> of the forty or so that went to Fort Snelling with you, um, how many came to Texas with you? All of them? All of them. Okay, so all you were with a bunch my of class, people see? you knew. Pardon me. You were with a bunch of people yes. you knew. But when we got to Texas, we would some of us were closer friends, of course. But we had to make arrangements to see each other because we we weren't in the same barracks. Some of us were in different, you know, regiments and things like that. Was this your first? foray into the south yes and and what it, what kind of impression did you get from that uh, meeting southerners and the well mostly we, you met them when you went to town you know I, uh, that was mineral wells which was a pretty run down town many black people I should say that coming from South Dakota I had never sent I had never been close enough to a black person to shake hands till I was in high school, when one of the people who was a speaker at a graduation was entertained in our home. And that's the first time I'd ever been that close. And uh, up there, it's Indian people who mm -hmm. are the minority. So in a very benign sense, you've gone through a culture shock. Yeah. And how old were you? Well, let's see, that was 1943, so I was going on 21. 21 years old, yeah. and you're in Texas, and Tell us about hot. the kind of training you got. It's uh, rough. <laughs> it was uh, very hot. I, I, mean, I look back at some of the notes I kept, you know, before I came up here, and that is to the library. And uh, it was like 115 degrees. We, when we got down there, it was in April, and the Army decides, uh, it's like a place I used to work for later. They had air conditioning, but you didn't turn it on until Memorial Day in Philadelphia. And uh, that, you didn't change from uh, your winter wools until suntans until it was the proper date. It was not yet the proper date, so it was mighty hot in those wool garments as we went out. Had heavy calisthenics, lots of forced marches. It, I mean, that was the first thing you did was to show that you weren't too smart and weren't ready yet. So they put you out on a 25-mile march with full field equipment in about six or seven hours. Everyone would come back with blistered feet. And, you kind of got the idea, this is the Army. <laughs> what kind of physical shape were you in? I was in very good shape. Were you in good shape? Yes, I was. So this was uh, not easy, but it, was, it wasn't a killer for you? No, it was not a killer. I'm, I'm reading some of the things. I mean, I, we, we went out, I remember it said there was 250 of us went out and 150 dropped out along the way. And I was among the 100 that got back okay. Okay, and you're learning how to suffer in the heat. Uh, what else were they teaching you down there? Well, they would give us lectures on, uh, and, and training on, on, on uh, armament, rifles. I, I noticed in my notes that we did not have the Garand rifle yet, the M1, which was the stock weapon in World were War II. We were using Springfield, Springfield 1905s, I guess they were, yes. for training, you know, for doing arms drill and things like that. But when we went out on the firing range, we used the M1 rifle. And we fired everything Durant's. from we fired everything in the course of that 17 weeks, which it turned out to be started out 13, and they extended it four more. But we fired everything from rifles up to we actually pulled the lanyard on a 155 millimeter howitzer, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. A lot of obstacle courses where live ammunition over your head, that kind of stuff, and then force marches, problems, where you go out and you were, had to solve problems as to what would you do in this situation? The enemy's over there, you know, that sort of thing. You were uh, being trained to, as an infantryman? Yes, that's right. Uh, but you still uh, were learning something about uh, artillery? That's right. So you were getting a well-rounded well education? Fairly much, uh, not as much as it later when I got to the infantry school. But at the, and during this time, we did not know what was going to happen to us. Because, I mean, we had regular army sergeants who said, here we are, you know, 20 years old, 21 years old. And he says, what do you young punks think? You're How do you think you're ever going to be officers? in this army, in this man's army. <laughs> you know, and they, they really poo-pooed the idea that we were ever going to go, we were going to, you're going to be cannon fodder is what you're going to be. So we never knew whether we were going to have an opportunity to go to OCS or not. Although, and I'd, I had forgotten this fact, but when I read back through, well, my mother, uh, I found in some of her stuff, she died about four years ago, but she was a pack rat for mementos. But she, I found a package in some of the things we have, which was, says World War II letters, Harold, me, <laughs> and then her three brothers, who were also really? in the services. Yeah. What a keepsake. So, yeah, and I, so I opened that up over the weekend, <laughs> you know, and I discovered that we actually had, uh, ex we had uh, appearance before 
a committee for officer candidate school. During that time I was in Texas as on basic training, so it was kind of a formality, but we still weren't sure of that. Did you feel you were in a kind of limbo that yeah. you didn't know if you were going to be oh, an yes, officer or not? Absolutely. What was the dividing line or the criteria? For what? You mean whether, whether you go you're going to make it or not? Well, you, you, we didn't know and what, until they finally shipped us out. What, they, what did they do? They gathered all of us together again, sent us, and put us on the same troop train in the same cars. And off we went. We didn't know where we were going. <laughs> we wound up in Denton, Iowa, at, some, at Grinnell College. We went. Really? Yeah. And they were just marking time. And then what, what they did, they sent us back to South Dakota State College. All of us. And by that time, the dormitories that were in the, the Army Specialized Training Program had taken over all the dormitories. In fact, that was even before I left. I was living in a rooming house before. But they put us all together on double, bar, double cots, you know, mm -hmm. in uh, the basement of the women's dormitory. Well, and, good for you. And, yeah, <laughs> and we were, we were in, enrolled in the, in the Army Specialized Training Program. See, so, I mean, I took a course. I was a chemistry major. So they, I had took a course in mechanics and in metal machine shop and that sort of thing, which, you know, we got there, what, August or so? Of 43. Of 43. Yeah. And then we uh, shipped out sometime when it was after Thanksgiving. Again, the whole group. They hadn't told us where we were going until that time they said, you're going to Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay, that's beginning to get serious. Now that's it's getting the serious. infantry training school. That's right. And uh, there are still 40 or so of you together? Yeah, there's, there were actually 44 of us who uh, got, who went to Benning, I guess that's right, because, I mean, the, the, the dean of women called us because uh, everybody thought we were really something coming back to our basic school, you know, all the girls thought this was great. So the dean, dean of women called them the 44 kings. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's and not that, that name has stuck. I mean, that, in, the, in the stuff for alumni things, it talks about the 44 kings and so on. So I'm one of the 44 kings. <laughs> in any place along the line here, have, did you get a choice as to what you might rather do than what were the Army? Some of the, you? there were some, I remember one man who was across the hall from me in the dorm. His name was Roy Shelton. He came from Watertown, South Dakota, 25 miles away. He had a, he had a St. Bernard dog, <laughs> which was, took up half the dormitory room. But at any rate, he, he went to Texas with us, but he applied to be trained, to be transferred to the Air Force and Air Corps in those days. And his, his uh, request was honored. But then uh, after about eight weeks down there, they, uh, they, uh, they told the rest of us, there are no more transfers. You stick in the infantry, you see. Well, their intention was to send us to Benning. Benning. That was in the back of everybody's mind, which was the infantry school. So. Okay, so you're going down to Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, did the military at any time, as, as you're going along through this process, did they talk to you about the cultural differences you would face uh, if and when you left the United States? I don't remember any. I, I, that's not quite true. At Benning, it wasn't so much culture as what we might expect when we get there. I mean, at that time, uh, the, the, the main fighting was in North Africa. And we had, they had people who were officers, captains, majors, yeah. who came from, from the battlefield and who were instructors at Benning. For us, so we got that was November '42 uh, until so April. They're coming back now to tell you what was going on yep. over there. They'd be on a leave, and then they'd probably go yeah. back to the to some unit, if not their own. And what 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 grade with these guys? Uh, the old captains, majors. Yeah, yeah. Men who had been in combat. Oh yes. In North Africa and not yet Colonels. Sicily. Uh, I don't think uh, I'm a little vague on the dates yeah. there, but okay. they, there would be people that. They would have done that throughout the rest of the war. They brought back officers who had been on the line, who knew what it was like to give you, you know, on-the-spot training. That was helpful, I would oh, think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And after, uh, okay, tell us about Fort Benning. This is a very serious place to be in. What happened, what, what did it you was, do uh, there? It was more intensified things. I mean, it yeah. was uh, more of the same that you had uh, in basic training, but now there was more checking out whether you were really qualified to lead other people. Other and how did men. they determine that? But, well, there was a lot of uh, problems that you had to solve. I mean, I read, I read this one letter I'd sent back to my mother, and I said, we have just, we have just been teaching, been taught 
how we should deploy machine guns and 81 millimeter mortars on a defensive line. And I drew a picture of how they enfiladed on the machine guns and how I had, to, they had asked, in fact, we had to go out on one problem that I told, her, told my parents about, where we had to make a rec reconnaissance of the area. It was an 800 yard front that our battalion was to have at Fort Benning. We fought the Civil War over, we really fought Civil War problems over again. That's what they do at Fort Benning. Because, you know, Sherman went through Georgia and so on. But at any rate, uh, we, we had to say, okay, where would you put your, he your, your heavy machine guns? You're, you're, you're a heavy weapons company. There's one heavy weapons company in every battalion and uh, three rifle companies. Is that what you guys were? You? Uh, well, that I was, uh, we were, we all in the class okay. went out and we were reconnoitered that area, see? And we were supposed to say, okay, where would you put your weapons? You've got, uh, you've got your machine guns and you've got your 81 millimeter mortars. And when we got back to the bleachers, as I, I told my parents, I was called upon to come down and show them, them on the map where I'd put my weapons. And why? And I, as I, I read this yesterday to my wife, I said that I'd, and there was a picture there, you know, that I'd drawn. And I, so I showed uh, with the pointer, I said why I would do that. And they said, very good, that's the school solution. That's what, that's what Fort Benning's solution is. So, so that's good. That's good. <laughs> that's right. Which we used to, the school solution, you know. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure that was a comforting answer. <laughs> oh, yeah. That is a comforting that answer. That was good. Yeah, that's right. Now, your rank is still? I'm, uh, I'm a corporal. You're a corporal now. Yeah. Okay, right. you've been promoted twice. Yeah. So, uh, and I'm a corporal until April of 1944. Okay. When, we were, when those of us who were left, uh, the uh, group, we had lost, it was 130 in that barracks. At and Fort we were, Benning. Yeah, and we were down to 85 by April. And there were three or four meetings, which before each meeting, you didn't do anything except you, you had to fill out a rating sheet. And you had to answer questions about what you do in certain situations. But part of it was there were 22 of us at that point on our floor. It was a two-story barracks. And uh, at the beginning, I forget how many there were. But we, what we had to do, we had to rank in, in order all, everybody else, including ourselves, uh, who were the most qualified in our, in our opinion and why. And I, I, wrote, I saw again in the letter that I wrote, I said, I'm going to have a lot of trouble with the next one because the committee flunked out my 10 lowest men from the last rating. Oh, so you're picking up some better men now. That's right. But I mean, that was, see, that, what that meant was that, that I was in tune. I really was in tune with, with what, they were, what we were supposed to be doing because I had actually picked as those who were least qualified the ones that got busted. What happened to the men who were busted? They got, they, they went overseas. One of our people went, he went to, to D-Day. He was a machine gunner at Normandy. And he survived. That's what they did. He went right to an active unit. And they went in as replacements. Which was not a very good thing to do. <laughs> no, it, it wasn't too healthy. So your duties did not change significantly after you got to Fort Benning. This is what you were going to do. We knew what we were going to do if yeah. we made it through. But I mean, it was intensified. And as I say, it required more searching of what your real abilities were in terms of leadership. Each of the, each platoon, uh, which was up one floor, uh, had a tactical officer who, who was glued to you. I mean, every place you went all day long, that tactical officer was with you and he had his little black book. So he was taking notes all the time. Can you look at something in your background? I take it you came from a religious household. Yeah. Um, good parents, um, very rural upbringing. What prepared you f to become a leader of men in the United States Army? Genes. <laughs> and the way my, my parents treated me. It's a, my mother was one of only two women in the state of South Dakota who was a, who was a superintendent of schools during the 30s. You know, and uh, I mean, she she was just short of maybe two courses to, from a master's degree. She graduated when her, when she was when she was uh, in 1915. I mean, her father, who was uh, I often say, if you you, you see these uh, second-rate Western movies, the Odies, 
the guy that owns the town, mm -hmm. my grandfather was that guy, except he was a real decent guy. And when he was, uh, when he had graduated from eighth grade, each of the boys in the family, they lived in Iowa, my great grandfather gave each of them $2,000 in cash to do what they wanted to do. And my two, two of my brother, my great uncles, my grandfather's brothers, one of them went to college and went to Johns Hopkins, got the first PhD of anybody that graduated from Luther College in Iowa. His brother was the second. My, my uncle took the money and went to South Dakota and he bought land of people who had decided there were greener pastures farther west. So he owned hundreds and hundreds of acres up there. And when, it, when my mother graduated from high school, he says, Nora, you can be anything you want. And he insisted that she should go to the university and her sister as well. And I mean, that's, my father had an eighth grade education. That's all. He went to a business school in Mankato, Minnesota. And people later would say, well, Nora, did you and your Lester meet at college? And my mother says, we went to different schools. Good for her. <laughs> you know, but but she, was, she was high powered. She, she died in the bed I was born in, in, in Marlboro, you know, in 1996. But she was lucid up to her last moment. So your answer is genes. Genes. Well, it's a lot of it. And then the way, yeah. the environment I was brought up. I was always treated uh, pretty much as an adult. Nobody ever talked down to me. But I had, I had opportunities to move in those circles where it was certain academic and I was treated, you know, I was the first grandchild on both sides for about eight or nine years. So I, I, I was treated well. You were well, well looked after. Yeah, I was well looked after. Yeah. Okay, tell us about getting out of Fort uh, Benning. Okay, we uh, had uh, leave, so I, we got on an airplane, those of us, uh, well, we all did. $65, I, I see. There was the air flight from uh, Atlanta to Minneapolis on a DC-6. I wouldn't and, pay for the cab, did they? <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> but uh, I wound up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which is, uh, my, my dad picked me up there, and, it, and so I had two weeks on leave, and then I had to report to uh, the 103rd Infantry Division in Camp House, Texas, which is near Gainesville, again, close to Fort Worth and Dallas. And Denton, which was a girls' school, which was a very nice thing to have <laughs> as an extra resource. But uh, I, got on a, I got on an airplane. No, I didn't, let's see. I, I took a train. Took a train to Omaha and then another train down to Dallas, and they picked me up there. And I was assigned to my first division. I was assigned to uh, Company H, 2nd Battalion of the 410th Regiment of the 103rd Infantry Division, which was the Cactus Division. It's okay, don't let me skip over sure. that point uh, at which you're going to get your commission, or have already gotten it. I have. Did you get it coming out of Fort Benning? Yes, there was a, a graduation day, okay. April 18th, 19th. So you went home as a second lieutenant? I did. You must have, and your family must have been very proud of you. I think so, <laughs> yes. Okay, now you're back in Texas. Worried, though. Yes. Uh, this is the middle of a war, and you're about to pick up the troops for which you'll be responsible later That's on right. in battle. It, it turns out that it was, yes. Tell us about that. Well, I went to, to this company. The, uh, the captain was a man I really regarded highly. His name was John Silver. Silver? Yeah. He's a Jewish person. And he, he was a captain. And he was so good, in fact, that he was promoted to major, and we lost him and he went to battalion headquarters as the operations officer, which is S3. And uh, then we, we got another officer. And I was the youngest, first, you know, I was the youngest officer and also the newest recruit to, to the job. So I got, I got all the dirty jobs for, to start with. Which Absolutely. In, of course, which included uh, having to lead force marches with the, the new, new people coming in, see because we, well, we were getting new recruits that were being assigned to the division. So on fr every Friday night, I took them out on a 25-mile hike, you know, full field equipment. And uh, officers have to be right. You have to be able to do it, which means you wind up carrying two or three rifles before you're done with it <laughs> to get back. So that, that really toughened me up. And then we went out in problems. I did, I, I, again, when I wrote back home, I said, a lot of this job is being a teacher. And I didn't intend to be a teacher because I get assigned, uh, you know, how do you, how do you, what do you do in case of a gas attack? Or how do you operate a Browning automatic rifle? Or what do you do in this kind of a field problem? 
or what about, uh, what about venereal disease and health problems and things like that. And I'd be called upon, I'd, they'd assemble 50 guys and uh, 50 uh, privates and non-coms, and then I'm supposed to give an hour lecture on that and, and field answers, see? And that, that kind of stuff. And then take, this, take the unit out in the field and do problems. And all through this, this is summer again in Texas. <laughs> nice going. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's great. And uh, so that was it, getting ready. So because we, that was from, uh, that would have been about first part of May, right? May 1944. And we got on, we got on a train at the end of September 1944, headed somewhere. I take it you get Garand rifles by now? Yeah. Okay, and you're on a train in May of 44. Is that correct? I get, I, well, I get there in May of 44. Okay. Yeah, well, that's right. I got, that's my train to go to the division. And I say I, all summer until the end of September, we trained. And it was getting boring, you know, because they'd send you out on a field and you'd do the same thing over and over again. Did you have any inkling where you might go from no, there? No, not a bit. Uh, did you think you might go to the Pacific? Oh, yeah, it's possible. Sure. That was a possibility. We didn't know. I mean, when we got on the train and we started seeing what direction it was going, we knew we weren't going to the Pacific. Wouldn't that have made a difference in the type of training you got? Um, I don't think so at that point. Maybe. I don't know. There's a difference between the Siegfried Line and Tarawa. Yeah. That's, yeah, right. That's, I wouldn't, yeah, that's right. Siegfried Line's tough enough. <laughs> Been there. Done that. I know. <laughs> and, and we're going to get there in a minute. But we got on the train and it headed east along the central of Georgia and through Chattanooga, Tennessee, and and on up to New York. So we to a, to a uh, deployment center, staging area, uh, north of New York City. As an officer in this organization, uh, did you have to help in the packing? And I use that uh, term loosely here, but putting together this group of men and their supplies. Were you responsible for any of that? You know, I can't really recall. I presume that I supervised that and made sure because uh, we, you know, we rode together on this train. I mean, I was, I was with my unit. So I imagine that, uh, well, there were also non-commissioned officers who were in charge, you see. Yeah. How many men were you responsible for? Is this platoon size? Or? Yeah, it's a, it's a platoon size. It'd be about uh, 20, what, 24, let's see, 200, probably 50, something like that. 50 men. Yeah, something and, like that. Uh, you're only about 22, 23 yeah, years old right. now. Uh, but uh, they're your boys. They're my boys. And, and you're the father figure. You're the second lieutenant they're looking to to keep them alive. You're, you're out, outside of New York now, and you're about to ship overseas, is that correct? That's what we expected, that's tell what happened. When, tell us when the word came down. What did they tell you? Well, we knew we were going overseas. I mean, they, they didn't, but we didn't know just where or, you know. But uh, they just, they, they didn't tell us what our destination was. In fact, they didn't, nobody knew, not even the officers knew until we were on the high seas and they opened their orders. Where did you get on a ship? We got on it. Uh, right off 42nd Street in the Hudson River. Because when they gave us leave for about three days, three nights. And we, so when we got off, we were right at Times Square. So you literally yeah. sailed down the Hudson River and out of New York Harbor. That's right, past That's the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. No, it was. I, and I wrote about that too. You know, I said I'm passing the September Statue of Liberty. September 44? That was October 44, October. 6th of October. Uh, October 6, 44. And you get out to sea and what did they tell you? They didn't tell us anything yet. I mean, we did not know where we were going till we got there. I mean, we got oh, they we only really got didn't. clues. They didn't tell oh, us. Okay. And I, I presume maybe the the, the, gen, the ger, general knew where we were going, <laughs> I mean, but we didn't know where we were going. We we knew that we were going across the Atlantic Ocean. Where did you go? We went through the, the Strait of Gibraltar to Marseille. So that was. Uh, I mean, we we knew we were in the Gulf Stream because of the, the color of the water. I mean, it's just, it's magnificent on a sunny day. And I wrote back, I, I said, somewhere, sometime in October, somewhere on the ocean. <laughs> and then I said, uh, I have a military secret, which I'm going to share with you. There's a lot of water out here. <laughs> well, that narrowed it down considerably. Yeah, right. And then we ran into what was a hurricane. 
And uh, so that was, and I, men I mentioned there that my stomach was behaving well and that uh, I was still enjoying every meal, but there's a lot of guys looking over the rail. There must be something very interesting down there. <laughs> you know. Did you go through the straits uh, in daylight? Yes, we did. I mean, when we came in, of course, you could see the lights of North Africa. Mm -hmm. And of course, Gibraltar and Portugal and Spain were neutral at that point. So everything was lit up. The, sh the fishing boats came out and they're all colored sails, you know, and uh, dolphins following the ships. I mean, they were, you know, and it was, it was really exciting, you know, coming in through there and that they could follow the ships to get the garbage and things like How that. How big a ship were you on? It was large. It was a general class, uh, General Brooks. It was, it was a general class. So there, um, there, it was a large convoy. But so I, I suppose two thousand men. And you went to Marseille in in southern France. Yeah, this and is. You but, went ashore there. Yeah, we went, but the 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 action had already moved north. We we landed on the twentieth of October. Forty four. We went. Our ship was larger than some of them, so we went over the sides on the, you know down the nets and stuff mm -hmm. and, and disembarked that way. This is what Churchill referred to as the soft underbelly of Europe. Did you find that was true? Well, by the, it was gone by that time. See, we went into Marseille and so on. But we, there was a staging area outside of Marseille. So mm -hmm. we, when we got off the boats, we went there and we were probably there for uh, maybe a week or so, something like that. And then we, again, we got on trucks this time and uh, vehicles to go on up the Rhone River Valley. And we, to, we were committed uh, first part of November or end of October uh, at San Diego which is uh, the part of the Colmar pocket, which is uh, just, just before you would go into Basel, and if you were going into Switzerland, it's down in that area. Colmar is a large city. But our division was committed at San Diego in the Vosges Mountains, which I, I was just, I was reading as something in the, one of the, the histories of the division, where no, no power ever had successfully wiped out resistance in the Vosges Mountains, ever, in any war. Nobody had made it through the Vosges. We did it. Our, our division was the first division that crossed the French border into Germany in all of history, you know, against resistance. Can you narrow this down now in terms of um, <coughs> the, 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 the chain of command? Uh, who was your commanding general? Uh, at first it was, uh, what was his name? You didn't, well, Patch was the, was the uh, Alexander was, Patch. He was the the uh, army general, and I forget the name of the man who was our division general at that time. So he he left uh, after Bastogne, so because that Anthony McAuliffe, who was the guy in charge of the 101st Airborne, you know, who so said nuts. Yeah, he's the one who became our division general, he and did. in fact, he came as a brigadier. And when he took that assignment to, to the 130, he was elevated to major general. And I, I don't remember the name of the commanding That's general. That's quite all right. Mind, yeah. Tell us what you and your troops did now. Well, <clears throat> we, uh, I was, at this point, I had started out uh, with machine guns. I was in a heavy weapons company. But they, they made me uh, the, the lieutenant in charge of the 81 millimeter mortars. So what we did, I mean, that was involved forward observers, and it involved just deploying according to the battalion sector, the sort of things that we did at Benning, uh, which you usually do in a, when you're in a defensive position, which is any time you're not moving in the offensive. I mean, you, you scout, out, scout out the front line if there is one, and then you try to, you, you set machine guns so that they will strafe in any direction that anybody tries to come in. If you, if you have a draw or something, you make sure it's enfiladed so any column coming in, it goes down the, the, the axis of the column, your, your line of fire, and you usually try to have crossing bands of fire. And then there are places which may be depressions, which somebody could come in, you can't cover with machine gun fire, that's what mortars are about. And a heavy, an 81 millimeter mortar is a heavy mortar. There are, each rifle company actually has light mortars and so on, 60 millimeters or something like that. When you say heavy, for people who have never seen 81 one of these. is uh, 22 let's see 25 millimeters to the inch so uh, 75 millimeters would be three inches and that's the diameter of the shell and there's a projectile which is TNT 
and uh, shaped, you know what it's shaped like, I mean you've seen like any weapon, has got a kind of pointed nose. And then it has uh, six, I think six charges at the end, powder charges. And there's a lot of tables that you do, you elevate now, you know what the angle is, it's a little problem in calculus, <laughs> which I knew about. And uh, you you look at the chart for the distance that you want this thing to go, and you remove that, remove those charges, uh, so it gets down to the right one. And then it's got you put in what looks like a shotgun shell in the back base of the of the mortar shell, and uh, then you def you pull the pin on the shell, and then you drop it down the tube, and it hits a point down there, and the igniter sets off the powder charges, and wumbo, and it's it's a parabola, you know. It arch, arcs over, as is all artillery, and uh, and that's what you use for filling in the gap. So that that would probably uh, that would kill anybody within a 25-yard radius if it landed. The impacting shell, yeah, yeah, yeah. just landing. If it's worse, if uh, if it hits a tree because it's a it's a contact explosion detonation. So if it, if it and this was what was so bad about the Bosch Mountains, there's trees everywhere. <laughs> So artillery shells coming in, if they burst in the trees, then you get a, you get a rain of shrapnel down and it covers even bigger. You know. So Harold, you're now in combat. Yeah, that's right. Against the German army. Did you know who you were up against? Uh, what, what outfits were on the other side? Yeah, well, because we always, you always sent, you send patrols out, they send patrols out, and you try to capture prisoners. You know, you, get, you, you, you try to capture somebody and then they get interrogated. So mm -hmm. you, and usually uh, somebody will tell who, where they come from, or you can tell by if they're stupid enough to wear their patches, and Germans seem to be kind of stupid sometimes. <laughs> I used to say that one of the things about the differences that we experienced, the SS was something else again. The Wolfwaffen uh, SS, that was the elite guard of Hitler's elite guard. But uh, I used to say that when, if you could knock off the officers, they were so regimented that a, that a squad of um, infantrymen didn't know exactly what to do. If you had a squad of American soldiers, you weren't done with that outfit until you killed the last man. I mean, there were, everybody had learned enough tactics and strategy to know what to do if they were, if the ships were down. Self-reliance there. Yeah. In a larger view, what was your objective? Where were you going? Eventually, we were going to go across the Siegfried Line. That's, that's where, that was our objective. That was north of you at this point? Yeah, we were, we'd actually, the Seventh Army came in at San Diego, which I told you was, would have been maybe, uh, let's say 30 kilometers, something like that from the Swiss border. Then we moved north and then towards Strasbourg. And then they moved us farther north, so we were moving up northeast to the northeast corner of France. <coughs> Excuse me. You're about 23 years old still, I uh, guess, or if, yes, if you had 40, a birthday. Yeah, I am 22 years old. Tell us about being in combat. Well, What's it like? Pretty scary. Well, it's. It, it, I said uh, again in the letter. I said there's, uh, except it's it's fierce when you're actually on the attack. But I, I was so surprised that there was so much of it where you're just kind of sitting or you're marching. You know, so it's it's scary at times. And, and then there are always artillery shells that come in. I mean, over the course of time, I mean, I, I, I have been sniped at three times that I, re I, I know the first week I was sniped at, which knocked off my helmet. So that, that's pretty scary. And uh, then I, two other occasions that I had in my notes where uh, one, one had gone right over my head, and then one when I was in a jeep that keeps landed in the road in front, and we just hightailed out. So I was sniped at twice. I was. Uh, I was hit with shrapnel three times. Uh, one, I still have a scar here, although I never reported that because <laughs> I didn't want to get pulled out of the line. And it was a, you so know, you it, didn't get a purple heart. I didn't. You know, I didn't want to get pulled out of the line. I didn't want to leave my outfit because a lot of times if you got pulled out for a week, you get sent back as a replacement someplace. Oh yeah. And I didn't want that. So the medic, I mean, put some sulfur on it and we kind of patched it up with a nice fancy uh, equivalent of a band-aid and as I say I got a scar there about that big so and quite bloody but and then but I would, another one ripped my ripped my trousers and I, then there was another time where I was you know, as I said the first person I saw killed was somebody in the machine gun unit he was 19 years old he'd been in my slit trench the night before he scared to death 
that if you, you talk about being you, your father to some of these people. <laughs> you know, even men 40, 50 years old would come in and talk about their marital problems. And I'm supposed to counsel them, see, here, 22 years old, what I know about that. But I, I mean, this, here, here's this young guy. There's a, it was a tree burst. This was artillery. And a big chunk of shrapnel ripped right through him, right through his body. I mean, he just died right there. I mean, he's two yards away from him. I mean, that was, that, I mean, that was really shocking. But I mean, you get so callous after a while. I mean, I've been out on the side of a hill for, you know, two, three hours, and we're, we're digging in, and the, sh the shells are going over the top. And as I said, you can, tell the, you can tell after a while, by the sound of it, how far away it's going to land. And if you don't hear it, you go, you're gone anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I mean, so I mean, I'd sit out there, eating my K rations, and actually quite calm until afterwards. Then you get nervous. It's kind of, and when you when you get pulled back in reserve, I mean, your bodily functions. I mean, you get diarrhea, because here you are. I mean, from from the October twentieth until Christmas Day, I never had a complete change of clothes. My first shower was when we got pulled back just before Christmas. So, I mean, I had everything I owned in my, in my, on my person. A toothbrush, straight edge razor, which we didn't use very much of. Nobody was up there checking <laughs> to see if you shaved or not. Mm. And uh, there you go. But the weather, terrible. Cold, wet. Uh, were you at an altitude or were you getting snow at this time? Yeah, we had snow. This is in the Vosges Mountains. Okay. No, I, I was up until about I was uh, on the on the front line uh, until about middle of December, and then I was assigned to be a liaison officer between the my the second battalion and regiment. And so, uh, I mean, I got into some difficult situations, but I was no longer a front line. Uh, front line. It means just the difference between sitting there with the, with the gun right, in, <laughs> you know where the people are shooting directly, and it's like being uh, 500 to 1,000 yards behind, half a mile, something like that, you know, where the, where the company headquarters is and the battalion headquarters. So when they would, uh, when they would determine what was going to be the outlay of the, dip, of the position or what the plan was, my job was to go be at division headquarters and to carry those orders to the battalion commander. This is the winter, you're in the winter of 44. I'm in the winter of 44. In Europe, which was a, an exceedingly severe winter. Uh, it's cold. You spoke of Christmas just a minute ago, coming off the line. This is about Bastogne, it, w it was taking place in Belgium. Right. Where, where were you guys at this Well, time? they pulled us out of the line. I mean, we had actually, we had actually got to the Siegfried line by that time. And what they did, for among other things, they needed troops to because von Rundstedt had uh, made that, that invasion into into Bastogne, but he had a long peninsula out there, you know. And Patton's job was to cut that off, to isolate Rundstedt, von Rundstedt. Sorry. Incidentally, one of my uncles, my mother's brother, was in a Norwegian ski battalion, and uh, they committed them at, at Omaha Beach and D-Day and at Bastogne. So he was in Bastogne at that, and he survived both of those battles. But at any rate, we, they pulled us out and we were moved out onto the line. So we were right near Bastogne. We were right off the flank. We, because what we had, our assignment was to make sure that the lines were not infiltrated during that time. In the larger uh, organization or Tabor now, are you part of the Seventh Army? Yes. And when did you get to join that? Uh, when we when were you assigned to that? When you came when we ashore? came into the okay. line, yeah, at, at San Diego. Yeah. So this is the group that is called the Forgotten Army. Is that correct? I don't. That, so, we never thought we were forgotten. <laughs> no. It, 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 are, are these one of the units that uh, uh, <clears throat> gasoline was not given to you, or no, we other things? No, no. Maybe I'm mixing this up with something. I mean, when else. we when we. After Bastogne and things kind of settled down, yeah. then they, they actually did shorten the line. So when we went back, we were back maybe 50, 60 miles from the Siegfried line again, back in the area that, you know, we, all those people that had been liberated were now under the German authority again. Mm -hmm. But we moved, the line moved back, and that would have been about the end of January. 
of 45. Of 1945. And we sat there. We, there was a defensive position on both sides. I mean, so the only, only thing that was really happening was occasional machine gun fire, firing and artillery sh shells. But until March 15th, so that would be like the end of January, I think I arrived at, uh, in Booksville, which was the town where our headquarters was, at about the 29th of January. And from then until the middle of March, we were just in a stalemate position. Nobody was doing anything except they were pulling supplies up. I mean, I went back there after the war, and there were still artillery shells and everything else you can think of, incendiary material stacked like six feet high that we never even used. But I mean, we had, talk about supplies. I mean, we won the war on supplies. <laughs> so at no time it was. See, Pat ran out of gas. He ran out of gas at Normandy, because yeah. he wanted to keep going, but he didn't, they, he didn't ran out of gas for his tanks. But you felt that you and your men were adequately clothed oh, yes. well, and fed uh, all this time? We didn't have, yeah, sure. I mean, it was K-rations and that kind of stuff. But you were eating and you were, you were do you, did you have an overcoat, top coat? Yeah, I believe I did. But it, that's still cold. It was wet. Everything was wet. And, and, and boots, adequate boots, yeah. footwear? Some people got uh, athletes, what do you call it? Not, not trench foot or whatever Trench foot, that's right. Yeah. But, no, I was adequate, but the weather was bad, <laughs> and it was cold, but I never got sick. And, and how about uh, your men? Uh, surely in the winter, exposed as you all were, there was sickness and illness. Did, 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 did men have to leave your unit? Not or much. Did you get no. replacements? No, we got some, but that was mostly when somebody got killed. Yeah. But I mean, I, I don't recall any particular f casualties from sickness. Can you tell us your impression of aerial support that you got? Were there planes? Lots of it. I mean, by that time, the... Uh, what were, were they doing for you? They, they'd come in on strafing missions, some bombing missions. Could you call them in? I couldn't, but uh, I could call back to battalion. Yeah. And uh, they would, well, a regiment, they could call it in. And the weather was I even, mean. I even sat out on a hill one afternoon being bombed by our own Air Force, though. <laughs> so they, sometimes that didn't happen very often. The, well, we felt, I mean, it was really by the spring, you know, after March, in the morning you'd see these waves of B 29s coming over from Great Britain. And I mean, there'd be streams of vapor trails behind them, I mean, from horizon to horizon on their way into Germany in then bombing raids. And the, and the Luftwaffe was essentially grounded by that time because we had air superiority. So, I mean, our experience with the German Air Force was an occasional Messerschmitt or Stuka dive bomber, but nothing in force, nothing like Italy or North Africa. <coughs> you folks are, uh, it took, went through up to the Siegfried line at one time, then came back. And did you come back up to it again? Yes. You're crossing the Saar River? Um, I don't remember what the name of the river was. Okay. But we, we came up in Northeast, yeah, and that March 15th is when it started, and then, which was preceded by an intense artillery bombardment across the whole front. I mean, and by that time, uh, there was hardly a building in any of those little towns that was even standing. And then and we, we advanced. And I mean, that went fast. It started going pretty fast. And then you got to the Siegfried Line, and uh, I mean, that was, uh, those entrenchments were really fierce. I mean, they'd, they'd developed a defense in depth. The Maginot Line was just pillboxes along the front, all aimed out over Germany. Of course, when the Germans came in 1940, they just came around the other side. <laughs> yeah. You didn't do that with the Siegfried Line because the pillboxes were arranged so they covered each other, and they were grown over with grass, and it'd be just a little peephole. And, concrete several feet thick. I mean, we had 240 millimeter howitzers, which at 240, that's almost 10 inches. That's the size of that, that's a big, and they'd bring those things up and they'd direct fire and then chip off concrete. I mean, what you had to do, you'd come in and you know, you'd sneak around the side and you'd throw a grenade in through that hole. It was slow business. Tell us but about the through. orders that you got us, are you, are you Yet uh, a first lieutenant? Had you been no, I didn't get. I wasn't first lieutenant until after the war. Okay, 
But tell us about the orders you got now. It's the late spring of uh, 45, and everybody's starting to move very rapidly in the area that you were in. Right. Uh, what were your briefings like and the officers above you? What were they telling you uh, was ahead of you and what your objectives were? Well, we didn't hear far in advance, but we know in general. So we, we knew that we were going to head for the Rhine, and which had been crossed. Mm -hmm. And then, then we were told that we were going to be assigned for about two weeks to uh, kind of solidify the position because the, 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 the tanks and everything else was moving so fast. So we, we, we were in uh, Heidelberg for a period of time. In fact, I, I was in Heidelberg when Roosevelt died in April. And then, we, then we, we just moved fast from then on. We were, and we knew that we were headed now for, for Austria. So we went down through Ulm, Garmisch, Partenkirchen, Oberammergau, into the Inn Valley, into Innsbruck. That was between, uh, you know, maybe the um, 10th of April until the 5th, 4th or 5th of May, when the war ended essentially for us. Before you went into combat, uh, what was your opinion of, of the German army? Very respectful. <laughs> and, and after the fact? Oh, yes, same. Yes. I mean, was, I mean, they were, they had by that time begun to enlist uh, kids. So, I mean, there are a lot of the people that you got were maybe 15, 16 years old. I mean, that, that's not an army. But, I mean, uh, the people that we met in the Vosges Mountains, they, they were pretty fierce customers. I read a something the other, the other day that uh, I found very troublesome, uh, that uh, a lot of the Hitler youth were out and around at this time in the last few weeks of the war, and that they would fire at the American troops and then surrender. That is, after they killed guys or wounded guys, then they'd just say, well, we quit. Did, did your organization run into anything like that? No, we didn't, that I know of. And you were meeting still uh, stiff resistance, or was the uh, German army falling back? It was falling apart after, after March 15th. Well, maybe, say, by the 1st of April, it was collapsing. Communications were, you know, essentially knocked out. So they, they, that is their communication. We'd come in, we'd move so fast. I mean, we'd move 40, 50 miles a day. On, on vehicles, anything that had wheels or tracks, you know, we were riding and going down a road. I remember seeing a, a uh, newspaper clipping which talked about the front. Well, the front was Patton, who was 20 miles out on one road ahead of everybody else with a line of tanks behind him, you know. But, I mean, he got away with that because the communications were badly disrupted. We, uh, we actually, uh, one, of our one of our companies in my battalion, I uh, ran in on a regimental headquarters who were having breakfast in a tent. They didn't know we were within any place. I mean, a complete surprise. They had no idea that we were there. I mean, we captured the whole regimental staff, you know. Were you running into civilians that uh, were, you, were you scooping them up as, as the Germans went? There was a vacuum and then you guys came along. Uh, who were the people you were finding uh, uh, from the civilian side of this? Well, if you came, well, for example, when you went through those towns, there's nobody there. They'd all left. They'd been under artillery shot. I mean, the thing, the, the, the smell when you go through those towns that had been fired upon for two, three weeks, you know, and the rubble and the smoke still coming up and death, you know, putrid bodies and that sort of thing. Yeah. Awful. What a smell. And silence. All you could hear is the feet of, uh, as we're walking through that town, your feet and the smell and the silence. But then the people uh, never, never met anybody that was a Nazi. <laughs> yeah. Never. All the Nazis always somebody gone. else. They're, yeah. they're gone. So the, the people themselves, uh, we couldn't fraternize. There was no fraternization permitted. So if you go into a town, there were people there. That they had all moved to one side of town bunk in and we moved into the other side for, for the night, you know. So we didn't have much experience with them. The, we began to see shortly uh, people from concentration camps who had come out, they had their striped clothing on, emaciated. And we, we actually liberated a few of those camps 
And uh, I, I was in Dachau, but not until after the war. I, I transferred later to the 45th Infantry Division in 45. And they were, they were stationed at First and Fellbrook, which was six kilometers from Dachau. So, I mean, I got to go over there and it was still hadn't been cleaned up yet, you know. So I, I have seen that, sent pictures home to my family. But that, you'd see people along the, the road, refugees, but I mean, we were moving. They're walking along the road. They probably were farther to the rear when, when the division came up. I suppose they had a problem, but we didn't have a problem. We were on the move. Dead horses. I mean, I see after the war, uh, when all the little farmers, in, both in Germany and France, they'd live in these little towns and then they had a plot out in the country and they'd walk out and they, they, were, they didn't have any horses left. So they'd hook up the cow. They'd jump the cow to plow and then they'd take the cow back and milk her at night. So they were destitute, most, many of the people. You spoke of uh, being in Heidelberg when uh, Roosevelt died, President Roosevelt died. Uh, that's roughly the f first week or so of April. April. Uh, and the war is going to end in about a month, a month or so. Um, in Europe? Yes, in Europe. Tell us uh, where you were as you got near the end of the war. And did you know you were... Uh, that close to it, we there were kept the rumors were coming at all the end of April that the Germans were going. There were two times of rumors: one, the Germans are going to surrender; other, they were going to make a last-ditch stand in the Tyrolean Alps. So that was a nerve-wracking thing. But we uh, we moved on. We crossed the Danube River. The bridges were all gone. I sat out in my jeep watching the engineers put up a pontoon bridge. You know, and we moved the whole army across there. <laughs> you look at some of the roads and that. At, at Ulm, and then we went to, to down, the, down into Oberammergau area, you know, where mm -hmm. the Passion Play was played. And uh, then McAuliffe is our general. They had sent out advanced parties. We, a, a German major from Innsbruck had sneaked through the lines and with a white flag, and he'd met with McAuliffe's staff. And he said, the people in Innsbruck are, are ready to turn the city over to you. And I just said, there's still a group down there that doesn't agree with that. Well, by the time he got back, that group had taken over again, you know. But uh, there was, we sent down, a, we could call us, sent down a group, and they got through the lines. And so the 409th Regiment actually made it down into Innsbruck about 7 o'clock on the, it was the 3rd or 4th of May. And their orders were to continue through Innsbruck to meet the 5th Army coming up from uh, Italy through the Brenner Pass. And so they, what they did, they left only two people behind in Innsbruck, and, and the, the resistance had taken over the city again. And we came down uh, a little later on during the night, because we, I arrived with my group in Innsbruck about 7 o'clock in the morning, and we actually, McAuliffe had our unit come down with headlights on. And I mean, we, we'd pass machine gun nests on the road. I mean, the Germans think, it must be over. I mean, nobody would be so stupid. <laughs> so we went, into, we went into Innsbruck. There was not one shot fired. And all that day, I mean, I went in and had breakfast in a restaurant. <laughs> and I mean, there was German officers sitting there with their weapons on. I mean, it was the weirdest day I ever saw in my life. You know, and then I had, I had a colonel. Where, colonel. where exactly are you in time? I'm now about the 3rd or 4th of May, 1945. Okay, so we're within five We're talking days. about, yeah, it's over here. I mean, yeah. there's no war. I mean, all that day and the next couple of days, they're coming in with their weapons and surrendering, and they're being put into enclosures. A colonel came up to me, I wanted to know if I was an officer. Yes, well, then I want to surrender to a colonel. I said, well, we don't have a colonel, but you can surrender to me. And he gave me his sidearms, and off we up marched. You know, I mean, very weird. Very then, weird. Uh, you were in a very interesting corner of Europe at that yeah. time. Uh, when, it, when you meet the fifth coming up from Italy, that was Mark Clark's people. That's right. That's, that's I was just reading about that in the Stars and Stripes, which I'd sent home, you know. And it was a, there was a one jeep ahead of a column from our, from our 409th Regiment. And they're, they're going through the pass. And coming from the other side is another jeep. And the sergeant gets out, and there's a lieutenant gets out. 
And he says, are you the fifth army? <laughs> this guy says, we are. He says, we're the 103rd. <laughs> and they shook hands. That's a great encounter. Isn't that it's something? It's a very historic one. Tell us where you were the day the war ended. I was in Innsbruck. You were in Innsbruck. Yeah. And what did you hear? Uh, what did I, all the Austrians seemed to be happy. I mean, they really did. They, they talked about being liberated, not being overcome. And of course, uh, later, a few days later, it was declared Victory Day, VE Day, Victory in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, the division put on a tremendous display of power. You know? So we were coming down the Maria Theresa Strasse, which is the main drag through Innsbruck. I mean, all the tanks and all the equipment and the weapons and the airplanes flying overhead and a division review. I mean, the people just standing there, you know, intentionally to show that the conquering don't heroes. Fool, you know. Don't fool with us. Yeah. yeah. And what was your orders, uh, Lieutenant? Well, then I was, the war's over. And so I, I was assigned now to division staff as a, as a military governor of the Inn River Valley. And I had, my, my job now was, I had to traverse the, the valley, it was maybe 60 miles long, down to Obergurgel, which was a resort area in the, in the Tyrolean Alps on the Italian border. And I, I had several places I had to stop. I'd go down one day, come back the next, and I had to stop to hear complaints from the civilians and to try to work things out. We were, we were trying to be good occupiers, you know, and be decent people. So I did that for uh, some time until uh, about June, so maybe a month. And then one of my friends was in the division military police. And he says, why don't you consider coming up here? And so I asked for a transfer. I'm still in the infantry, but I was transferred to the division military police. But I didn't stay there long because they started breaking up the 103rd already. So I, I had orders to uh, move to the 45th Infantry to division military police as an infantry officer. So that's, that was the assignment I had and kept until the 45th moved out in the first part of August on its way to staging area and the, what we understood was the 45th Infantry would deploy from Le Havre and go directly to the CBI, the Southeast, Southwest, Southeast Pacific, China, Burma, India theater. <coughs> so we were in a staging area outside of Reims uh, when the first bomb was dropped. And the second. Otherwise, uh, you guys would have gone on to the invasion yeah. of Japan. That's what we expected. Or you were on the other corner. And, and Patton, by that time, who went, and he addressed us. I mean, we had thousands of men there, and he was up on the stage with a microphone. He was talking about these little yellow, per very, he had flowery language. Swinging out of the trees, we're going over there and kill them all. You know. So it was clear that we were headed for Japan. But then, of course, they sent the 45th home. I didn't have enough points to stay to go home yet because they, they, I had, I didn't have enough. I didn't have awards like that. Even my uncle, who was, he had three or four Purple Hearts and a Distinguished Service Cross, <laughs> and uh, five battle stars. I had two battle stars on my European Theater ribbon medal, but it wasn't enough points to be discharged yet. So I was assigned to stay in Europe. I stayed another year in Europe. A whole year. Yeah. Just for the his, his historian's point of view, tell us about seeing George Patton up on a stage. Well, I saw George Patton in a jeep going by. I saw George Patton running troops across. You've seen the movie where, uh, uh, what's his face, who played Patton? George C. Scott is standing there with his riding crop and the tanks are going through the mud. Well, I've seen Patton directing traffic across the river. <laughs> you know, he's, he was an impressive man, let me tell you. <laughs> I mean, he was always right up there at the front. And, but he was a loud mouth, and, but he gave, we really thought he was something. How about McCullough? Well, he was a gem. I mean, he was also one that was always out. I mean, he, for, for the first period of time, in fact, all the time he was with us, he would be up with the frontline troops, mm -hmm. maybe talking to the men, giving them encouragement. Said maybe I, well, how, somebody would say, my mother is so worried, he says, I'll, I'll write her a note. You know, that's the kind of guy he was. You spoke a moment ago of uh, when you were in the MP <coughs> duty going up and down the valley, uh, complaints from civilians. What was the nature of some of these complaints? 
It will be all the things from uh, property, that, property that got confiscated by the mm -hmm. troops or to rape, or excused rapes, things like that. And uh, at the same time, I was also, I began to be a trial judge advocate for the, for the division, which is a prosecuting officer. And in fact, I did a lot more of that before I came home and, you know, courts martial and things like that. So you'd have to investigate that kind of stuff. What did you do in that uh, extra year you were in Europe, at least up into 1946? <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll, let me just I'll run through it real quick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was assigned back to a redeployment area for troops coming through on the way home. And because I had military police experience, I was made assistant provost marshal of, of Camp Pittsburgh, which was outside of Mourmelon Le Grand, which is uh, north of Paris. And, uh, and that was, an, you know, every, everything that had a, was a military police incident which included traffic control and everything like that. Any, any kind of criminal behavior that was under the jurisdiction of the uh, Provo Marshal's office. And the, the man who was Provo Marshal got shipped home, and so I became Provo Marshal of the camp. <coughs> and uh, later on, I, I was contacted by uh, the man who was the head of the 398th Military Police Battalion. He was a lieutenant colonel. He'd been, he was Eisenhower's aide-de-camp during the ETO program, but he was assigned to, to military police duty. And he'd heard about my experience. He says, we need a person in, the, in Company B of the 398th. Are you interested? I said, sure. So I got orders transferring me to Company B. And I, the, my main job, I was, I was, you know, I was a mathematician and uh, pretty good with that kind of stuff. A lot of detail. I, I mean, I was very good at doing that kind of stuff. They had lost something like a million dollars worth of equipment including jeeps and stuff. And I mean, my job was to try to track down where all that stuff was or to write statements saying it must have been lost in combat. And I mean, I cleared up a million bucks worth of charges against that particular company by adequate paperwork, you know. So when the, when the company commander left, I suddenly became company commander of, of Company B in the 398th military. Please and, and you're still a second lieutenant? I'm, I'm a first lieutenant now. Oh, okay. I, 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 was I should think you would be. <laughs> And I would, if I'd stayed in Europe, I could, the, the colonel, he was really pleased with me. <laughs> and I had a military police uh, stockade for general court martial prisoners, had a prisoner of war camp under my jurisdiction. And then, of course, um, about one quarter of northern France, including in the north end of Paris, was part of the jurisdiction. See? And so I had, I had, I'd come up out in the morning with, I had 250 military police. And I mean, I had 50 of them with motorcycles. And it looked like hell's angels. <laughs> Here I am, you know, 22 years old, and the first thing I did the first night I was there, I came out to check the guardhouse, and the guy was on, who was on duty was asleep, and I had court martial charges on the colonel's desk by eight o'clock the next morning. So I did a, I, I had a very tough stance. I say, when I finally went into the ministry years years later, my mother says, "Remember, you're not in the army anymore." <laughs> Anyway, so I stayed in that job until June of 1945, when I got my orders to go, go home. So. We spoke earlier be, before this tape, and uh, I understood you stayed in the military a while, or stayed in some reserve? In the reserves, until, until 1953. Okay. So that's eight years. All righty. So uh, what I did, I came back to Brookings, and I, I finished a bachelor's degree. On part of the questionnaires, it talked about uh, benefits, you know. The GI Bill got me my bachelor's degree and got me a PhD later on. And because I was, I was in the first class at Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley in uh, nuclear chemistry after the Second World War. And so I, when I graduated in 1950 with a PhD, I had money in the bank because I had the GI Bill and then I worked for the Atomic Energy Commission on my research, so I got paid for that. And thanks to the Army. I mean, I... It, it I, all paid off. It paid <laughs> off. That's, I'm grateful to that. Is there that. a most memorable experience in, in your very long and uh, sometimes arduous career? Something that you think about more often than not? Are, we talk, are you talking still about being in the Army? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I have a hard time picking something right off the bat. Okay, how about a memorable character? Well, I got Somebody one of them, I'll tell you. Out. 
Yeah. Other than George Patton. Yeah, no, his name, his name was Agis Mahalikas, a Greek, uh, handlebar mustache, called him Mike. Uh, first met him on the ship going over. He and I were in the, we were 20 of us in this one stateroom, so-called stateroom. And he started shooting off his mouth about, he was a professional wrestler. And he said, well, when I was working the, working the rings around the country, he says, I'd go into the police station and I say, uh, have you got a good pair of handcuffs here? He says, uh, I'd like you to handcuff me and I'm going to free myself. And he says he'd do that and then he'd toss the thing. And of course, all these guys are saying, oh, sure, sure. And so they got the provost marshal of the boat who had a, it was called peerless set. It had a counter lock on it, you know. And so he crossed Mike's hands behind his back and put that on with the lock on. And then the money's going out on the table. <laughs> you know, he'll never get out of this. And he's betting, I'll get out of this, you know, and he's making all these noise. Well, this is a little higher than usual. I mean, I'm mean, wondering, of course, he's working this up. Whambo, right in the middle of the table, open handcuffs. Uh, who knows? I mean, the Pope Marshal. <laughs> I guess. Let's you take know, a look I, at He never told cups. me why I did it, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, he was, he, he made, he had diamonds, he was a gem setter. Uh, he was a scholar, an organist. After the war, he and I, he liked to go to cathedrals. And then he, we went to Augsburg, the Augsburg Cathedral, where, you know, the Lutheran Reformation mm -hmm. started. <laughs> And we went in there, the, and the man who was uh, the, the, the organist was a Jew who had uh, been there in, in, during the war. He had uh, refuge in that place, sanctuary. But he gave us a tour around the cathedral. So Mike says, hey, could I play the organ? Sure you can. You know? And so we went up in the choir loft, and Michael's, this, the, the organist is stomping, pumping the organ, and Michael is playing Home on the Range. And we look down there, and out of the out of one of the rooms, at least four or five men come out with their clericals on. There's a meeting of the bishops of southern Germany, <laughs> and they look up like that. <laughs> <The Americans. Great. laughs> but he was he was very memorable. I mean, absolutely. I, in fact, I kept when I went to graduate school. Uh, one of my advisors turned out that he knew Mike Mahalikas as well. Did he? His really? family came from San Francisco, so I went over and looked him up, and he moved to Cleveland, but we did make contact. I didn't ask you a moment ago. Uh, what were your decorations when you came home? I had uh, I had I had only medals that you would get from being there. I had a combat infantry badge, of course, which meant you were actually in in combat. And then I had uh, the victory medal and uh, two two major engagements: the, the Central Europe and uh, the Rhineland. With those, those are battle stars on the medal and uh, the Army of Occupation, but uh, I had nothing, nothing like Bronze Stars or anything like oh, that. Oh, you could have had a Purple Heart. I could have, yeah. yeah. And, and I might have been dead then, too. Yeah, that's <laughs> I absolutely mean by, right. I mean, later assignment, you know. Did you join the reserves, and did you join any veterans organizations when you came home? I, I did, because uh, in my hometown, South Dakota, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, was big, and I, I joined it, but I never went to any meetings. I, I let it lapse when I went uh, up from there to Brookings, back to school, and then to California. What kind of reception did you get when you came home? Very uh, good. Uh, oh, well yeah. received. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, family talked to you about what you'd done. I wasn't talking much in those days. You know, I mean, I, I remember going down the street, and an automobile went by, and an exhaust banged. You know, and I hit the dirt. <laughs> So it's still kind of a little traumatic yet, but I didn't talk much about it. Is it because nobody asked you, or you're just? Uh, well, people kind of avoided the subject. I okay. mean, when we got together, see, those we all went back to Brookings. That are, those of us hardly, I think, only two or three of our bunch got killed. Luckily, you know, and we we all went back, and finished college together again. Those forty some guys. The kings. The kings, and I, I mean, we got together regularly, go down and drink beer, you know, on Friday night. And then we talk to each other about where it'd be done, of course. That's okay. Yeah. Those were members of the clan. Yeah, my college roommate, my best man, first marriage, uh, was a guy named Sherwood Berg, who was older than the rest of us. He was a captain in another division. But he and I were roommates the last year in Proctor's in the dormitory. But uh, uh, we talked all the time. How, Harold, how important to you was serving in the military? Very. 
it, I, it, 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 I paid a cost for it because uh, having been gone for what was about three, at least three, three and a half years from uh, academic life, I had finished all my coursework except uh, the last quarter or so of organic chemistry and uh, physical chemistry and I had to have some advanced mathematics and uh, here I had a hiatus for almost, you know, three and a half years and I mean I, I spent the rest of my academic life, it felt like catching up because I always had to get some elementary so that I kind of slipped back in my mind, see? But I graduated and uh, was first in my class. <laughs> And then I became a doctor. Is that PhD. Yeah. Uh, Jack Glenn Seaborg was my was my research advisor. Glenn Seaborg discovered plutonium, got the Nobel Prize for that, and uh, used to ride with him to the seven. He had a week one one time a week seven o'clock in the morning where everybody at the radiation laboratory got together to talk about the research. And he lived about two blocks away from me. I didn't have a car, so I always went over there. Was present. One morning he says, I'm going to be delayed a little bit this morning, my wife's giving birth. So we went in and delivered him one of his children and then we went off to the research. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I was in the first crowd. I mean, I had, when I went out to the Kennedy Library here a couple of years ago, I mean, there's that picture that John Kennedy had the Nobel laureates, you know, where he said, never has there been so much intellect in this in this room since Thomas Jefferson dined alone. <laughs> oh, yes. I remember that. But I looked on there, there's about eight of those Nobel laureates that I had on my P, my orals committee or my thesis committee or professors, you know, more than that, ten. You know, Lawrence, Ernest Lawrence, who discovered the cyclotron, you know, he, he's, he's part of the reason I went to Berkeley because when my mother went to the University of South Dakota, her roommate was engaged to Ernest Lawrence. And she dumped him because she didn't think he'd amount to anything. <laughs> <laughs> there you go again. <laughs> what did you think then, and what do you think now about the war you were involved in? I, I somewhat blithely called it the last civilized war. You know, I remember one time on March 15th that I, I was making contact with Company H from the battalion. And I was walking through woods, I mean, the artillery's firing around, the smoke all over. I'm on by, I'm by myself. And over against a log is a young German soldier. He's wounded. And I mean, I didn't even think about it. I went over there and uh, I pulled out some cigarettes. I offered him a cigarette and lit it for him. And I said, the Red Cross will be along soon. You're okay. And I walked. The guy could have shot me. But I mean, I, we were still humane, you know. But I mean, uh, I was really very much against Vietnam. I was a pastor in a congregation on the North Shore of Chicago at that time. I got to the seminary. And I used to, I used to look back at some of the sermon notes and I wonder how I ever got away with that. Because I was really against Vietnam. But then I wrote, I mean, uh, one of my long letters, I must have had a lot of my time, I've been, I've been reading Walter Lippmann when he's talking about the United States has no foreign policy. This is, now we're back in 1945. And I mean, I wrote a, I wrote an essay essentially to my parents talking about the need to be engaged in the world. That the trouble with America is that we had our heads in the sand and I mean we weren't ready for this and we have got to be ready, you know. <laughs> and I still say that. I don't go for the Star Wars things. I, I know that's stupid because that, I was trained in that stuff. I know there's no way you can knock down the, all the missiles coming in. But uh, anyway. You touched on this just lightly a second ago, but uh, how would you characterize the difference uh, in the way you were met when you came home and veterans from other subsequent wars were treated? Well, I think the people who came back from Korea were treated pretty decently, but the people from Vietnam were not. I mean, they were pariahs. I mean, I, I, was, I always made distinction about that. I mean, that the men, we must respect the men, they're fighting for their country. And the policy of the government, I don't like. But I mean, I think they received pretty bad treatment in general. I mean, I went down, my, my wife and I, when we lived in Philadelphia, uh, before I went to, out to North Dakota again, we went down to Washington just to see the Vietnam, you know, the Vietnam Memorial. And I mean, I, when I walked along, I, I mean, I, I tears just going down my face. I couldn't restrain myself. I just had a kind of a, Catharsis, <laughs> you know, and it's a great experience for me. Emotional wrenching to to see that wall. It's very effective. Yeah. 
Harold, is there um, anyone thought that you would like to leave here on this tape? Uh, something I haven't asked you. I sure wish that we would uh, be able again to go to the point where people would be happy and feel good about being in political office, foreign affairs and things like that. I mean, uh, I'm not happy about what I'm, what I'm going to vote for this fall, you know, whichever side of the coin it is. And I think uh, for one reason or another, I mean, who wants to be a candidate anymore? I mean, we all have some kind of dirty laundry, and uh, there's always somebody who wants to dig it out and act as if that's the issue. You know, I voted for Bill Clinton twice. I don't like what he did, but I liked him better than the other candidate. Mm -hmm. But I wish that, uh, you know, I, I would wish and pray that for America, that we could be responsible in the world. I mean. Abraham, in the Old Testament, you know, God says, I'm going to take you out of the Chaldees and I'm going to make of you a mighty nation and I'm going to bless you that you may be a blessing to others. And I mean, we're really blessed in this country. I've been around enough. I've been across the ocean back and forth seven times now. <laughs> and I mean, we, we're so fortunate to live in this country. I mean, there's so, and so many of us don't know what we've got. I mean, I'm, I'm proud to be an American. I mean, when I go see a parade again, I get chills up and down my back. I love that flag, you know? <laughs> Harold, thank you. You're welcome. You're a good man. We thank you for coming in today. Thank you for having me.